It is just beyond a huge honor today to be podcast interviewing Bart Nellinger of ProgressiveDental.com, who is an amazing man. He's president and CEO of Progressive Dental since 2009 after recognizing a need for marketing and consulting services within the dental field. Before launching PD, he was a leading surgical laser distributor and marketing strategist for clinicians in the Northeast. Bart has helped thousands of practices identify areas for growth, and he has been noted as one of the leading innovators in dentistry today. Bart has spoken for some of the industry's largest organizations, including BioLace, the American Academy of Implant Dentistry, Noble BioCare, the Dawson Academy, the Pankey Institute. He was recently recognized on the Biz Observer's 2015 40 and Under for Tampa Bay and has driven PD to be recognized one of 500 America's fastest growing private companies by Inc. Magazine since 2014. Due to constant innovation, growth, and long-term client retention, Progressive Dental has quickly become one of the fastest growing companies in dentistry. Man, you're an amazing man. I mean, you're just crushing it. Uh, I think you are so sharp. Now, you started off being ProgressiveDentalMarketing.com, and now you're ProgressiveDental.com. How, how did that happen in your journey? Yeah, well, we started off as, a, as more of a traditional marketing company. Uh, where traditional marketing companies have a mindset of, okay, it's our job to get the phone the ring. It's your guy's job to handle the phone calls and, and close the business, uh, close the cases. And I very quickly, I found out that, um, you know, if, if there wasn't a baseline set up ahead of time, if there wasn't uh, good business processes in place that the marketing, no matter how good or bad the marketing was, it had no shot to succeed from the beginning. So when you look at it from a business model um, in, in, in this industry, marketing and advertising, close to the between 30 and 40 percent of all business owners that start marketing decrease their budget or completely cancel their budget within 12 months. So that's why I have marketing companies at a really high volume. They have to consistently get new clients after new clients. I didn't personally see that as a sustainable model. And um, I saw that, hey, let's let's create a model that we're going to grow not by volume, but let's grow by retention. And that's really been um, how we've grown at 1,200% year over year is because not because we put on a lot of new clients, but because we retain the clients we have. And, uh, and that's as a result of offering training, so internal coaching. Uh, we help them set up, uh, train their their receptionists on how to take phone calls, and not general volume phone calls, big case phone calls, calls that you might not get, you know, ten opportunities a month. You might only get three to seven good opportunities a month at some of these cases, and a lot of times the cases are patients with high anxiety. They have to know how to handle those calls um, in the correct fashion to convert them at a high percentage. Also looking at flexible financing options internally, helping them out with their patient education process or their, their internal sales process. All of those things that have to be set up internally to get a good return on their investment. Uh, we switched our business model to doing that up front and then doing external marketing. So as a result, we've, we've grown slower in terms of the number of, of practices that we take on on a monthly basis. But our percentage in terms of losing, uh, our decrease in cancel rates at 3%. So, and, and we've managed 1200% growth doing that. So I had to drop the marketing name and, and I was totally okay doing, doing that because I felt like our, and I still feel like our industry, there's companies that throw that marketing term around and they're not marketing companies that it's, it's a company that really just makes websites or it's a company that really just does direct mail or a company that just sells this or that sells that they have a product list and they sell their products. We're set up as a, uh, as an agency style company and we're a company that specializes in practice growth. So no matter what phase they're in, it's very similar to a comprehensive dental treatment plan. Our job is to get clear on the current state of their practice where they're strong, where they're weak, what the obstacles are, and then our jobs get very clear on where they want to go and then design a plan, and it has to be customized. You can't just, the whole marketing in a box thing is not reality. I wish it was. I, you know, I would need a lot less employees if that was the case. Now, your dad was a dentist. You grew up in dentistry, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, my dad's a dentist. Mom worked in the office forever, still does. Uh, I've got three <clears throat> sisters, two of which now are out of school, and they're in practice with my dad. And um, it's, it's really interesting. Some of the things that I saw when I, when I first started helping him before I owned the company, it's the same exact uh, issues, just in a different way that we're seeing right now. Um, so, you know, grew up in it. Um, but frankly, before I got into the industry, I'll tell you, I mean, I had absolutely no 
nowhere near the appreciation that I should have had for my parents in terms of how hard it is as an owner operator for any type of business, but how hard it is to take care of the patients, go to all your CE course, deal with all the technology, manage all the finances, deal with all of you know the employees and hiring and training and just the whole thing. I absolutely was clueless as a kid growing up uh, and really didn't have near the appreciation that I should have. So it's very hard to do. I know every kid thinks uh, at age uh, 15 that their dad, mom, or the two dumbest people on earth and it takes until they're 30 or 40 to realize yeah they were actually smart after all right and do, do you think some of this uh you know just the overwhelming amount of just everything you just said you know you got to learn the dentistry the business the marketing the finance do you think a lot of that is what's fueling corporate dentistry where a lot of people look in the mirror and say you know what i, I want to be a soccer mom i, I want to leave at five go pick up the kids from school go to soccer i, I just do not want to deal with all this stuff do you, do you think that's a large factor, a demographic factor that's fueling corporate of people that just aren't going to bite the bullet and learn everything that you and your mom and dad have learned? Um, yeah, I think so. I think that I think that people, for the most part, that were trained to operate more out of a state of pain than a state of pleasure. And I think that a big pain point that doctors have uh, revolves around debt and, and financial pain points. And uh, specifically, a lot of students graduate from college, $250,000, $300,000 in debt. And it's playing a major, major factor in the decision process that they go through in terms of, should I start a practice? Should I go to work for a couple of years? And, and for the most part, they're highly focused on getting out of debt. Um, the doctors that have come into it and tried, a, a big, big blunder that I see is, hey, we'll go out, get a loan for the practice, get a loan for the equipment, but there's no soft cost built into the loan. So we don't budget anything to launch the practice correctly for the first three months or the first six months to acquire patients. And, and that oftentimes is your greatest cost, your cost to acquire and close the cases. And it's almost never accounted for on the front end. So what happens is they, they get a loan for the practice, they start a practice, and then they're trying to just get patients in the door. They don't have a strategy to do it, so they have to participate with insurance. You participate with all the insurance companies. They cut your fees. They cut your fees. Your overhead stays the same. So your margin just shrinks and shrinks, and then they have no cash flow or room, and making those moves is just too stressful for them. So they, they just kind of get on the hamster wheel, and, it, and it's tough getting out of that. So uh, I totally understand it, but uh, I'd say one of the most fulfilling part, things about what we do is – Taking a doctor from that type of a mindset and, and a practice that has been squeezed by insurance and over the course of six months, over the course of 12 months, um, you know, doubling, maybe not doubling their, their production, but doubling their profitability, uh, you should see what that does to their mindset and their ability to make strategic decisions for the future. So I, I just think that, yeah, there's confusion in terms of how to do it, but I think that in most cases, the financial aspect and the financial stress is the biggest component. And how much does that cost? If they went to progressivedental.com and they wanted to buy that service uh, for six months to 12 months, what does something like that cost? How does that work? I mean, from a, from a cost basis, um, it's, it's the same exact way as if a patient asks, how much is it going to cost you know, for, for my smile to look good? You know, you're just not going to know because – just like dentistry, there's so many different factors that could that could affect the treatment plan that would give them that outcome. Um, there's many more factors that affect growing a practice. So you have to know a few things in order to give an intelligent answer. Number one, we have to know and understand where the practice is at. So we have to be able to identify what the big obstacles are. And a lot of times what they think the obstacles are uh, it's not reality. There's other obstacles that need to be addressed first. And then we have to be really clear on what type of practice they want to have. And it's our job to create a timeline and roll things out in the right order. Uh, you can't just go and, and fix everything. And I, I think that business is a lot about anticipation. Business is a lot about understanding how to simplify complex problems and, and tackle them the one thing at a time, that one thing being the most important aspect of the practice is going to deliver the most amount to the bottom line. And in many cases, it's not marketing. Sometimes it is, and but in many cases, it's not. So, you know, when we do a consultation, we, we write out a plan and 
Um, you know, that plan's a first place to start for everybody. And sometimes the plan is as simple as saying, hey, uh, only 9% of our production is from hygiene. You know, I think we're missing a lot here. Maybe we put some protocols in place for this. Um, or a lot of times it's just a unproductive treatment planning process. Or sometimes, um, you know, they're getting, uh, they're participating with all these insurance companies and they'd be better off with the openings from a financial standpoint. So it's really, uh, there's really no way, just like a doctor and dentist can't answer a patient with, hey, how much, how much your services cost? You're just not going to know until you go through that comprehensive exam. And some dentists have a 10 minute exam and other dentists have a 90 minute and a two hour exam. And we're more on the 90 minute, two hour exam threshold than the five minute. Here's a turnkey marketing system that's, you know, going to fix all your problems. So how do my homies get a, an exam from Progressive Dental? They just go to ProgressiveDental.com or do they call you or do they email? What, what yep, do they, they do? Going to ProgressiveDental.com is uh, one of the easiest ways. You can go there and you can just call in. Um, we usually do, do, uh, do you, an initial phone call. Uh, I, I see on your uh, on the app, watch video, register today, learn more. Which one of those do I click? Um, you're probably looking at our Catalyst CE course. So if you're, are you on a, an iPad or a full screen or a uh, mobile? IPhone. If you're on a mobile version, you can just click for the phone number and just call straight in on that number. You can okay. call straight in on that number, dial zero. So, and so you that's what you recommend is that process. they just call? Calling, calling is uh, calling's really easy or they can go to the contact us page and they can just fill out a form there. Uh, either way, you know, to have and a what, consultation. What's that phone number? Phone number is 727-286-286. 6211. Say it one more time. 727 286 6211. I think, um, you, how many clients do you have right now? You're, you're, you're carrying about what, a thousand dental offices? Yeah, about a thousand. I mean, that is just, I mean, that, that's just completely unbelievable. I, I want you to, um, talk about, in fact, I wish you would, uh, uh, if you're on the app or you're on the PC, um, we put Dental Town Magazine online. And this month, my column was exactly what you're saying. You've grown so much because you're only losing 3% of your clientele and you're retaining 97. And my column this month was telling them that, you know, the average hygienist works four days a week, eight hours a day, 32 hours a week. Uh, we'll give her two weeks vacation a year. So in 50 weeks, she works 32 hours a week times 25 weeks, which is 800 yep. hours. And then so she basically cleans 800 people's teeth. And then the second half of the year, she does it again. So if the average dental office gets 25 new patients a month, then every two and a half years, you should be adding another full-time hygienist. But you go to these dental offices and 10 years later, they still have the same hygienist going uh, four days a week. You come back 20 years later, they still have one hygienist. I hear you. I, I wish you'd go on there and, um, and post a comment about yourself and about it's all about patient retention. Why do you think some dental offices um, have the same amount of hygiene hours after 10, 20, 30, 40 years. I mean, this guy opens his practice at age 25 in Parsons, Kansas, and at age 65, he still has one hygienist and says, Bart, I need, I need more new patients. Should I do a billboard, a flyer, yellow pages? I mean, he's already burned and churned every yeah. single person in Parsons, Kansas. What, 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 it, what and, and I see that in corporate dentistry. I see that in everyone. I mean, I cannot name one dental office that says, well, dude, actually, I've been open 10 years, and uh, we have three full-time hygienists, and we don't accept new patients. I mean, we can only service the amount of people we have. I, I don't see one example of that in every place I've ever gone. So, no. so new patients cannot be the answer. Well, it's not the whole answer, you know, and sometimes you get to a certain point where um, you know, if you got consistency with general volume, you know, general volume, I mean, how many, I don't get too many doctors call me saying that they want to double their new patients. It's usually about, hey, I want to get to this type of volume and then I want specific type cases. So, you know, they want to do either more implants or more of the complex occlusal cases or they want to focus on laser perio or they want to focus on um, ortho or a higher dollar uh, in terms of profitability, chair side time profitability. But um, you're exactly right with the amount of practices that you see that have gone 10 years, they still market. But if you look at their org chart, 
which is short for an organizational chart. You know, in business, you create an organizational chart when you start, and then you create your organizational chart for the future. And the reason why it's important is because as you scale volume, not so much dollars, but volume of people, you have to scale, you have to scale your infrastructure ahead of time to make sure that you can handle the volume, retain the clients, and also not put so much stress on your team that it's a miserable environment. Everyone wants to walk out the door. So for the most part, it's a lack of anticipation um, and, and a lack of knowledge on how to scale uh, the practice properly because you know, good, solid systems for, um, you know, a practice that's a $500,000 practice, they change for a $1.5 million practice and they change for a $4 million practice. So economy of scales that you hit and it's just diminishing returns where you just market, market, market. And you see doctors say, no matter if I spend three grand a month or I spend 10 grand a month, my, my production is just flat. And that's a result because they haven't scaled the infrastructure properly and they haven't updated their systems to operate at that type of a level. That's why that, that initial consultation is important so that I can really get clear on what's the model going to be. Do you want to have a volume-based model? Do you want to have a production-based model? You know, how do you want to practice? And I've got doctors that have strictly fee-for-service practice, and we see very low volume, very low volume. Our, our new patient acquisition strategy revolves around between five and 10 new patients a month, but they're very, very specific type of cases, and they have fabulous retention. And I've got other clients where you know we have to get them 80, 80 new patients a month, 90 new patients a month. So you got to be clear on what the ideal business model for the doctor is and, and, and what the end game is. But usually, you know, it's like, hey, we want to keep everything the same and go from a million to a million eight and for any business. So I, I think one of the, um, you know, so let's say you do a marketing. You say you do radio, billboards, TVs, direct mail, social media, Facebook, whatever. And you have two different dental offices. I mean, mm -hmm. one dental office, five new patients responding to that marketing would have to call before that receptionist scheduled somebody in a chair for an exam. And yep. then the office next door they might get one out of every two to call and right. neither dentist even is aware of what's going on at the front desk. And then you'll say to them, they'll say, well, in 2016, I did this big marketing campaign, but it didn't work. And I'll say, well, how many incoming calls did you have in 2016 versus 2015? They say, I have no idea. And I'll say, how many incoming calls from numbers not in your records came in 2015 versus 2016? No idea. Um, how much training did you train Betty Lou answering the phone uh, to convert these incoming calls. Oh, we, we don't run a trainer. Whenever I go to CE, I just go by myself to save money. And uh, I hired yeah. her off the street. She was the waitress uh, at my favorite restaurant. Uh, do, do you see that in the marketplace too? Oh yeah, all the time. And we will not, we will not take a client on if we don't track and record the phone calls. No way, no how. It's completely unproductive and you can't make adjustments. Marketing, Marketing is, edu is an educated guess, right? Because a real marketing agency should be trying new strategies all the time in different markets they've never tried before to try to make the process better. Um, but the things you're gonna look at is what is our direct response rate? How many people are going to the website filling out forms? How many people are calling? Um, and then you have to know what your conversion rate is. And from a doctor's point of view, if there's two numbers that are very, very important um, for doctors and business owners to know, it's number one is your cost to acquire a new patient and your average revenue per new patient. Those are two. Without those two numbers, you don't even know how to really create an annual budget that makes sense for your goals. So the difference between return on your a great return and a moderate return or a negative return is all in your ability to make adjustments to increase the revenue per patient. So one of the main things, take your example, right? Let's say we get 10 new patient phone calls to Office A, and we get 10 new patient phone calls to Office B. Office A closes five, right? So they, they close at 50%, right? So they got 50% of those patients coming in, scheduling appointments, moving forward. Office B closes one and gets them to move forward. They spent the same amount and they had the same exact direct response rate. So from our point of view, or for not from ours, because we track it all the way through the back, but from a marketing company's point of view, both campaigns did what they were supposed to do if that was your if that was your forecast, 10 calls. But from a 
from an efficiency standpoint and a production standpoint, one outperformed the other by 500% if they all came in and bought the same type of, uh, the same type of treatment plan. So it, it had nothing to do with the money. So if, they, if Office B wants to increase and do the same in terms of production as Office A, they have to increase their budget five times. They have to get 50 phone calls. They have to generate 50 phone calls. So if, if we're running a marketing campaign, my goal is 50 phone calls versus 10, I have to spend a different amount. I got to hit them with more frequency and more consistency. But at the end of the day, it was their conversion rate. So you have to track it, number one. We don't take on clients if they don't allow us to track it. And number two, we have to always be training uh, in terms of how to handle these phone calls. And for the most part, the same things come up. But they have to know how to sell and how to train. And we got to have the right person in that position. If you do, you're going to spend less, you're going to make more, and your marketing is going to be more efficient because you're closing at a higher efficiency. So, no, I, could, I couldn't agree more, and I see it all the time. So what did you say? You said the two most important questions every dental office needs to answer is, one, what does it cost you to acquire a new patient? And two, what is the average pay revenue patient, re average revenue per new patient? Is that what you said? Cor correct. Correct. And the answers to both of those questions will depend on what type of cases you're targeting. For instance, to just say just any new patient, you know, might be patients coming in for cleanings. Okay. So that would be a certain dollar amount. After a while, you would know what it is. Um, it's going to be totally different for an all on four case, right? So it's all supply and demand. So you said you won't take on a client unless you can record and track their phone calls. Yeah, we can because okay. if, if, yeah, you're okay. right. You know, I, I, I personally, you know, all the research and stuff I read is that if you just put a camera above the cashier's person, uh, you stop the embezzling, you know, 99% just cause they're on camera. Everything I've read is that the minute you start taping their phone call, who's ever on the phone starts becoming a performer. I mean, obviously when you're on stage, you're quite different than when you're in your bathroom all by, all by yourself, uh, singing in your hairdryer. Um, how do you do the logistics of tracking and retort recording phone calls? Oh, it's real simple software. It's called an RCF line or remote call forwarding. And it's just a, it's just a different, uh, it's a vanity number with a local exchange, a local area code that's placed on the website or it's placed on whatever media we're activating at that particular moment. When they call in, the call line intercepts the call and just forwards it straight to the practice so you can intercept the call, record the call. Um, and you're right, they will perform uh, generally much better when they're being recorded if they know that you're going to stick with it. Because this is the this is the big problem with training in dentistry is that hey sometimes the doctors say, hey let's go to this training course go to that training course but they're training or tracking afterwards so they go okay yeah we're gonna go let's let's go learn this stuff we'll learn it he'll forget about it she'll forget about it in three weeks and that'll be that and for the most part they're right so I would say in initial trainings no matter where you are they're listening I don't know twenty percent they're gonna retain twenty percent of the information if you're lucky but after that first 30 days or the first 60 days, when you come back and you have your follow-up training, you say, okay, here's our goal in terms of new patient conversion. Here's what was the reality for the last 60 days. Now, here's the type of calls. You were doing fabulous with this type of call and this type of call. There was one type of call where you only got 5% of them. And that happened to be a price shopping call. People that came in and said, hey, how much do you charge for a crown? How much do you charge for a dental implant? We were struggling. So you, once you start playing their recordings and you have active training and the trainings about their percentages, well, now they're listening 100% because A, they know it's not going away. B, they know that I don't want to post bad numbers. I don't want to post 10% or 5%. But if you just send them to a course, send them to a conference, even if I was there personally in your office doing the training, 20%, 20%, and as soon as they pick that phone up, because there's been no repetition in terms of practice, they're not going to use it. They're just not going to use the technique. I, and it, it's amazing. I mean, we, we track and record our phone calls, and I, I got one of, the, one of the best employees ever who's been with me 20 years. And about a year ago, uh, someone called her and asked if uh, I did Invisalign, and she said no. And uh, I was like, why did you say that? And she, she had heard me say talking about, there's now knockoffs like, you know, clear choice or, you know, these, these other kinds. So she thought I did not do Invisalign and I did something else, but she just told the patient, no, I mean, she didn't. So, so much of it's just, <clears throat> just communication. I mean, you know, I mean, she's the best person in the world, but she just literally thought I, I didn't do that anymore.
Um, right. So, so when you take on a client, you track and record their phone calls. Um, you do you send someone to the office, or do you have a webinar with them, or how do you how do you go over this uh, their phone tracking? How often does that work? We do both. Um, so, in terms of consistency, it's much much more efficient to go through consistent consistent training through webinars than it is to pay for a consultant to fly out and be you know have boots on the ground uh, every time. Um, there's certainly a call for that, and we do in office boot camps. We do in office consulting as well. But again, our job is to look at where the practice is and focus, be able to simplify the issues down to the and, and prioritize them and do them in the right order. For the most part, if we if we did no other training except focused on how to handle price shoppers and insurance objections over the phone, and we did no other training than finding out how to identify the primary desired outcome of the patient and flexible financing. If that's all we ever did and we just said, forget everything else in the practice and those are the only two things that we would do, you know, we would, we would be successful in growing the practice. So um, a lot of times, and I've done it both ways where we come out and we try to go through everything. You spend three days, you know, on site in the practice, it's just too much. And the, the more that you try to, to correct uh, at the same time, the harder it is to execute. So we try to uh, identify one critical objective or two max critical objectives, you know, for the next quarter or even for the whole year to work on. And uh, a lot of times it's just that that consultation in the back, flexible financing options and how to handle objections and handle price shoppers over the phone. From there, if we get good with those two, you're going to be significantly better situation and the marketing, the return on your investment from the marketing is going to be exponentially higher. It puts us in a position where it's very easy for us to be successful. You know, you, you talk a lot about, um, commoditization, price shopping. Um, and a lot of the market's gone there with PPOs. You see people advertising, uh, you know, $500 for a denture, then denture worlds across the street saying 399, then yeah. denture universe is saying 199. Um, Explain, you know, you're, you're talking to a lot of dentists who are good at algebra and trig and calculus. Explain what a commodity is um, and price shoppers and, and how, do you, how do you handle that? How do you deal with that? Commoditization and, and price shopping are, commoditization is the cause. Price shopping is the effect, okay? And this, if we understand nothing about any other trends going on in dentistry uh, for practice owners um, and clinicians in dentistry. So uh, what is a commodity? It's basically um, a product in which all things are equal. Okay. So it's a product like a dental implant would be. If the dental implant wasn't going to my head, you could put a, a fair market value on a dental implant. This is a dental implant from this brand. Okay. Dental implants worth about this much, right? So if all things are equal with a product, you can shop that product and you know you're going to get the same product. It's going to perform the same way. We all know that it's not that simple in dentistry. It has to be surgically placed in your head. It has to be restored. It needs to last. <laughs> you know, it's we're trying to get it to where it's going to last for the rest of your life. So all implants aren't created equal. That's the problem. But because that's the way they're being positioned to the public and we're marketing implants as commodities and we market crowns as commodities and veneers and lumineers and whitening and cleanings, people have the perception that they are commodities, that no matter what dentist you go to, an implant's an implant. We know that that couldn't be the furthest thing from the truth, but there's a lot of dentists unknowingly, they're perpetuating the price shopping. It was the very first thing I saw when I looked at my dad's stuff years ago. When I looked at his marketing, one of the one of the complaints of the team was, "Hey, we do marketing, we get a lot of calls, but they're they're not the types of calls that we want." I said, "What do you mean?" I said, "Well, I mean, it's just nothing. It's just price in town, and we're on the upper end in terms of fees, um, and and we don't know why. Every time we try marketing, I would look at the marketing piece, and what do you think the marketing piece had? A big fat price special, right? I'm going, of course they're going to call asking about price. Your entire strategy and all the messaging that you have." It, the the entire focal point is around price. So our job is to switch that, make it easier for the team to convert um, and, and attract patients that aren't looking for a commodity. They're looking for a specific clinical outcome. They're looking to um, they're looking for a solution to a pain point that they're experiencing. If that if that answered your question. Let let's say that um, you do marketing. The receptionist is good. She gets a lot of people in the chairs. There's so many dentists that if they did a hundred exams, 
they'd only find three things. Well, how do you how do you um, help a dentist to realize that you know other people are treatment planning more? You know, how how do you go about that? Well, that's kind of a it's kind of a touchy situation because you know we are a marketing and business company, not a uh, not necessarily a clinical company. Um, but I'm lucky enough to have gone to some of the best CE courses, um, you know, that, that this country has to offer and, and a lot of KOLs that are clients of mine and we're in CE courses with one or two times every week. Um, so we are aware of best practices, but it's, it's really not, it's not much of a situation of the doctors, um, just saying that it's not like they don't know. It's just that they're busy and they're seeing patients, you're on that hamster wheel every single day and certain things get missed. And when you bring things up, like take perio, for instance, we take some of these GP practices, even the ones that are doing great, you look at the type of perio that's diagnosed within the practice. And when you look at the numbers, you know that they're missing a huge, huge market there or, or a market like gum recession. It's just a simple fact of being busy and focused on other things. So um, if we identify that there's no standardization with the uh, new patient exam process, um, that's something that I'll help the doctor. And I help them by sending them um, uh, to, to speak with some of my other clients. You know, Dr. Cranham from Dawson, um, send them to talk to Dr. Sam Lau, former president of the AAP and, and um, institutions like the Panky Institute that we're partnered with. And we try to get that in place because it's kind of hard to treatment plan you know, do comprehensive dentistry if, if the treatment planning process isn't standardized. And these are all things that, you know, typically we'll talk about and, um, and, and help our clients with either before or, or during the time in which they're marketing. Well, I, I guess what I meant by the question to our viewers is that if you sent 10 new patients to Bill Strop, John Coyce, Peter Dawson, mm -hmm. Frank Spear, Gordon Christian, they would do 10 times more dentistry than if you oh, yeah. sent um, 100 patients uh, to the average dentist under 30. True or yeah. false? True. You're, you're in Clearwater, Florida. That's uh, that, that, man, that's a hotbed. You're right by Peter Dawson, who we just podcast interviewed last week. Uh, you're right next to Bill Strupp. You see Bill Strupp much? No, not you know what? I, I hardly see anyone in my backyard much because I'm never here. I'm here. I'm here about four days a month, man. I'm on the I'm on the road speaking. Well, tell tell Bill Strupp that uh, I, I just love that guy to death. I mean, that, that guy's amazing. <laughs> but uh, it, it's um, so you do the marketing and then, you know, some dentists uh, get equal number of phone calls. Some can convert twice as many into new patients. Mm -hmm. And then when they do get that patient, some dentists can diagnose complete dentistry and then yeah. some are in the middle with quadrant dentistry and some are one tooth dentistry. Um, you've also mentioned, uh, you've dropped the, uh, the word a couple of times, flexible financing. What, what do you mean by that? And, and how is that a game changer in a dental office? Price shoppers and they, they feel like, oh geez, my fees are too high. I need to cut my fees or we need to offer this because so-and-so is offering that. I said, look, it's not about, it's not about your fees. It's about how affordable are you? How affordable? How do, how do my, I, I have friends that make $45,000 a year. They drive an $80,000 BMW. How is that possible, right? Because they have flexible financing programs, lease programs that they can afford. They can afford the monthly payment. That's how, I mean, that's, that's our culture. So um, it, it's easier for me to sell an all on four at $28,000 a pop at $8.99 a month or $9.99 a month than it is to sell an all on four at $21,000 upfront. It just is. So, so financing is your way around uh, making something more affordable without discounting your services or discounting your value as a clinician. So it's, it's incredibly important to have that put in place and also to make sure it is clear and they're comfortable talking about different financing options and, and they, they understand how to solve problems, creative thinking in terms of um, the financing options. So no matter what, with that, with that patient in the room, we always have an option. There's never a situation where we send someone, send someone out the door going, yep, yeah, yeah, sorry, we just don't have anything else. So what financing companies do you recommend? What, what do you, who do you work with? Who do you like? Who's better? Well, um, there's a lot of them out there now. Um, you can't have too many, just like anything, but we like to recommend having three. So, you know, of course, Care Credit is a is a big player out there, and they're they're the largest brand. And 
Um, uh, it's been nice to see recently them um, loosen up their parameters uh, for the mid score and, and finance more people. Um, so Care Credit is one, uh, Lending Club is another, and then you're always going to go with some type of, uh, or at least we always recommend going with some type of a subprime type financing. Now, there's a lot of different programs. You know, um, uh, Bruce Baird has a program with um, Compassionate. Um, there's a company called iCare uh, that has a product out there for that. Um, personally, I like iCare over the in-house financing um, because it's a, it's, it's a guaranteed annuity. So they approve patients with, uh, with no, um, uh, no credit check um, as long as they have 30% down in a debit card. And then they kind of give the office uh, and, and the practice manager freedom to dictate the payments. And, uh, and from there, the, the practice gets paid as the money comes in. But like I said, it's a guaranteed annuity. So in the event of, of a default, that practice still gets paid. And it's backed and guaranteed by Merit Bank and, and their partner with JetPay. So, um, so that's the one that, that we usually recommend because, you know, even a $10,000 treatment plan, even if they don't have 3000 you can put them on a three-month layaway plan, thousand dollars a month, and then they're financed for the rest. So, we try to usually go with at least three, and those would be probably three of the mo three of the more common financing options. Okay, you said Bruce Beard and his, his what was the name of his? Uh, Compassionate. Um, but you, uh, but he is the uh, being the banker on that, right? Correct. Correct. And a lot of our viewers might not understand that. Um, the difference there and what that is. Can you talk about um, comprehensive finance with Dr. Bruce Beard versus uh, uh, Care Credit or iCare? Uh, how it's a different business model? I'll talk about the business models instead of comparing product to product or brand to brand. Uh, but for the most part, you're talking in-house financing, right? Where right. where you you absorb all of the risk. Okay, so if it's a ten thousand dollar treatment plan and they put three thousand down. And I do the procedure, the patient leaves and they don't pay me. We have our ways of trying to collect, but there's going to be a cost to collect. But ultimately, you're risking the $7,000. If it doesn't come back, you know, your recourse, uh, you have some recourse, but you're at risk, the $7,000 in risk. Um, with a company like, a, like iCare, where you're using an outside collection agency that guarantees payment, you don't get paid all up front like a care credit or, um, or, or a lending club, you get paid as the money comes in, but in the event of a default, um, they guarantee the payments. So my $7,000 is not my risk. It's their risk. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so you don't really recommend that kind you don't recommend, uh, you carrying the paper. There's too many other things to worry about for an owner operator business instead of collections. You know, I like to keep accounts, accounts receivables clean, um, you know, for my business as well. Now, we hold all the notes on anything for, for our business, but short, you know, short terms. And for, uh, for dentistry, you got to be focused on taking care of that phone, making sure patients are booking, making sure patients are accepting treatment. And so if I have an option of, if I have two options, one neither one requires a credit check, but one is a guaranteed annuity, I'm taking the guaranteed. You talked about Care Credit and Lending Club, but then you said you should have one that's subprime. Um, a lot of our viewers might not understand what subprime is. What what did you mean by one should be subprime? What I really meant by subprime is not actually the literal term of subprime, but uh, an option doesn't require a credit check. Because I know a lot of people can probably relate. You're in a consultation room doing a consult, and then you know, we tell them how much the treatment plan is going to be and that they don't want to fill out the paperwork for Care Credit and Springstone or Care Credit and Lending Club. And, and the reason is usually because they have a credit challenge. It, it, it could have been a bankruptcy. It could have been a divorce. It could have been a foreclosure. Um, and they don't want to fill it out because they know that their credit's not good. Um, so it comes in handy to say, hey, we have options that don't require any type of credit check, you know, if, if you're more comfortable with that. And sometimes it's like, yeah, OK, great. If I can get approved with no credit check, cool. So it's just a it's a way to remove an obstacle um, to provide a patient with an affordable way to accept treatment without getting into the price war that a lot of your competitors have. You know, the key is uh, charge for your value and then offer affordable financing options to make the procedure and make the treatment plan affordable for for the patients. Um, one of the problem, the biggest problems we have in dentistry, uh, you're you're talking about acquiring big cases is um. So many people in dentistry will just tell you they, they don't want to sell dentistry, that they're not, quote, like that. 
and yeah. they didn't go to school <laughs> um, to be like that. They're a doctor, not a used car salesman. Um, how do you how do you handle that type of uh, uh, mind frame? That that type, you know, when the dentist thinks like that, you know. Well, how do you handle um, that? When they say, "Yeah, we don't sell." We don't sell anything. We don't sell here. I mean, of course you do. I love I mean, it when they say, I'm not like that. <laughs> like, right, what, what right. is like well, that? What, what is that? I mean, they're they're referring to the negative stigma associated with the word. They're not referring to the literal definition of the word um, selling. Because selling, anytime there's an exchange uh, of, of money for a product or service, that product or service was sold to the consumer. So they, they make several transactions every single day. So to say that, that they don't sell um, is just in, inaccurate more than anything. But I think the real issue is how they refer to the word sales and how they refer to the word salesman. And when they refer to it, they feel that when sales pops into their head, they immediately think pushy, they think um, sleazy, they think lack of trust, they feel, they, they think of no rapport, uh, self-serving, all of these things kind of are, are planted right into their mind up front. Um, and what we talk about a lot is that's not selling, that's a bad experience in terms of making a purchase. But what's the difference between, because all of us have made purchases where we had a great time and a great experience and it was easy and we loved the person that we did business with and we've all had the experience, uh, you know, the same type of experience that was negative. We've all had the inverse of that as well. So what I, I tell them is, hey, you know what's interesting? Most of the time when the doctors say, hey, we don't sell or the team says we don't sell, I look at their treatment planning process. It's an interesting process where, New patients come into the practice, little to no information, little to no rapport. They sit down in a chair. They came in for a cleaning. Uh, you do an exam and you tell them all the stuff that's wrong with them and what you need to do. And if you don't do it, by the way, here's what's going to happen to you. And then you're going to go talk to someone else that you haven't met yet about how to get the money that you don't have to buy what you never wanted in the first place. Right. So for the most part, dentistry is set up for a negative commodity based sales experience where we're telling you what you need to do instead of finding out what you want and framing the treatment plan so that you view the treatment plan as nothing more than a roadmap to get you what you want. So if they might want to eat the foods they want, they might want a beautiful looking smile. They might want to save their teeth for the rest of their life. They don't necessarily want to treat periodontal disease. They don't want osteosurgery. Right. They don't want laser surgery, but they want to maintain their teeth. So as long as you find out what they want and you frame the treatment plan accordingly and everything to those patients, every all of our communication revolves around what they want, not what they need to do. No one wants to be told what you have to do and no one wants to be given an ultimatum. And for the most part, that's how practices are set up. So when I go through this at our, our continuing education course, it's something I talk about and we, and we put it out there. And, and it's something that needs to be talked about because as long as you know what's going to set up a, a good positive experience versus an experience where they feel sold, you know, then, then you're educated and you can do it. But I tell them, I say, you know, you think used car salesman, you think any salesman in the world has ever set out to make a buyer or a consumer or a patient feel that way? That was never their intention. They did it because of the because of their approach and the psychology in which they approach that particular buyer in dentistry. But you're right. It's just a simple fact that most patients, a lot of patients feel, hey, every time I go to the dentist, they got to sell me something every time. Like they don't even want to go to the dentist anymore because every time they go, the guy finds something wrong with me. That's that's a lot of people's mind uh, mind frame. So I think just becoming educated on what it is and what the difference between a good experience and a bad experience um, is, is a, a really important thing for all of my clients. And that's why we created that continuing education course for them uh, and their team to kind of debunk some of these myths out there. Okay, you you grew up in dentistry. Your dad's a dentist. Your mom works in it. Your two sisters are dentists. You, you're carrying a thousand clients right now. So many dentists I talk to um, don't think it's anything with them, the man in the mirror. They're telling me, well, you know, I we just never recovered from the 2008 financial meltdown. And, you know, the factory, you know, it went to Mexico and and you know this the state's losing jobs and the government's incompetent and <laughs> i'm voting for this guy or that guy how much do you think when it when a dental when a dental office is flat how much of it do you think is exogenous factors of politics and putin being in the ukraine and all this stuff versus they're not dotting the i's and crossing the t's and running their systems from what i've learned and and what i believe 
I think with any practice or with any business in general, I think the chokehold in any business is the limitation of the leader or the business owner's either psychology or skill set. So if they're missing a skill set, it can kill the business. If they're missing or, or they have the wrong or an unproductive psychology, it can absolutely destroy a business. For me, the the external factors of the economy, uh, the external factors of the political climate or, or what's going on, it, I, and I'm a business owner as well, right? So for, for me, it doesn't matter. I don't care. I'm, uh, you know, we're, we're going to get to this result and we're going to figure a way around it. Now, do they affect your strategy at times? Yeah, absolutely. But for the most part, when they're convincing themselves that what they're saying is, is there is the reality, it's really not the reality. It's really their reality. And, you know, it, it's, it's much easier to cope that way. It's, it's easier to cope with a practice that's stagnant if you believe it's outside of your control. I think it's very unproductive for business owners um, or, or professionals to, to buy in to our, our destiny is in someone else's hands. I just don't subscribe to that at all. And when I hear things like, hey, you know, it's the economy or, you know what, Bart, this area, this is what I get all the time. You know what, Bart, my area now, th this area is a little different. I'm going, I got clients in every single major market in this country and virtually every mid market in this country. So <laughs> they're actually not, you know, unless you're dealing with, uh, you know, a, a species from Mars and, you know, they're not actually humans. I mean, people are people. Um, but for the most part, when they say things like, you know, there's a big provider hard by the housing, uh, by the housing market bust, they're not wrong when they say it. But you also look at the market and I'll go, look, there's 400,000 people that live in your city. <laughs> there's 200,000 people. There's a million people that live in your city. Let's say that 99% of them are exactly what you say. Can your practice handle 1%? Who cares what everyone else is doing? What type of patient do we want? And let's talk to those types of patients. Don't worry about what the majority of people are doing. It's irrelevant from a business standpoint. It's just a way to cope to, to say, hey, it, it's not, there's nothing I can do. So that's why my practice is flat or that's why we have to participate or that's why I have to live my life this way. And it's not just in dentistry, it's just, that's everywhere. Yeah, I think it's so funny when they tell me about how bad their economy is in Oklahoma or Texas or West Virginia. I'm like, dude, I just got back from Malaysia and found a dental office doing 50 Invisalign cases a month. I just got back from South yeah. Africa and the dentist there is doing 50 implants a month. And the, yep. so Malaysia, Indonesia and South Africa can crush yeah. it, but not West Virginia. Are you kidding me? There's and, too many examples of in every market of, um, of people overcoming obstacles and 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 overcoming all odds and, and being huge successes you know i tell sometimes around here even in, in my own company i have between 60 and 70 employees and you still hear well i couldn't i didn't know this i didn't know that or, i didn't have this i didn't have that you know and sometimes i think to myself and and actually out of my company i think I'm the only one without a college degree i'm the only one that never went to college here <laughs> and i own the company right but if you don't have if you don't know something you think about it and you go get the knowledge it's as simple as that. Otherwise, you just sit around. Oh, I don't know it. So, okay, this is my life. I know. I love that when I'm talking to people my age that are, you know, in their 50s, and they're saying, well, you know, I just wish I could go back and go to college. And I'm like, dude, you're, you're still whining about something that happened 30, 40 years ago? <laughs> I mean, really? Hey, I want to I ask you a, another very specific question. So many dentists I go to that are blaming everything on the economy, they're in, they're in a medical dental building. And they have one hygienist full time and in the same economy, same city, same country next door to him is another solo practicing dentist. And he has two full time hygienists. Well, what, why do you think, why do you think, um, you know, half the dentists will have one hygienist for the rest of their life and the other ones will have two? What, what is just the, that fundamental difference? It's just that it's nothing more than the immediate pain point of, of hiring one and looking at the, the probably they probably have cash-based accounting for the most part instead of accrual-based accounting. And most of the decisions are based on a dollar amount that they're used to taking home. So if you got a dollar amount that you're used to taking home and we're living up to that dollar amount, you know, when you're thinking about, okay, I'm going to hire a hygienist, but if I hire her, what if she's not busy? What if she doesn't produce this? What if I lose money? Well, who cares? Even if you lose money, 
for three months in a row, even if you lose money for six months, having two hygienists that are highly productive um, is going to pay a long, uh, long-term dividends, and you're going to be able to get your recall in sooner. You're not going to have to book them out as long. You're not going to lose as many new patients. So from a business standpoint, if you looked at projections and forecasts, avoiding immediate pain point and fear of losing money, that's all that is. Because from a business standpoint, it doesn't make any sense not to. So um, do you also develop websites or do you recommend a website developer? I mean, you, usually 20, marketing and 20, a web- 25% of our business model. Web development is, uh, web design and development is about 20 to 25% of uh, the, the revenue makeup of our company. Because I, w- I was giving away my age because back in the day, you know, you would do a yellow page ad, a direct mail, and they would call the uh, the office. And I'm 54, so I still think like that. But the, the, millennials, <laughs> the millennials get a marketing piece and they go to the website. What, what is your thoughts of uh, the website? Well, it's not just millennials. It's everybody. It's it's I mean, look at the numbers. The numbers are just oh, come overwhelming. On. It's not your dad and it's not me. It's you well, and your two sisters. <laughs> it's the overwhelming majority. I mean, people right. that are people that are oh yeah, people that are sixty that they don't have smartphones. Of course they do. Um, and and really, where you get into people that are using the internet is doing research on um, uh, consumer based research on things that are going to cost more money. So if people are looking to make a major investment in their smile, they know they need a lot of dental work. Research research shows that if you're going to make a major investment or a major purchase in your life. You're going to spend 79 additional days doing research before you decide what you're going to buy and who you're going to do business with. 79 additional days. Where do you think they're going to do the research? Where are they going? They're going online. So again, most of the clients that that we represent, they want to increase revenue per patient, not necessarily only only volume. They want to get bigger cases. You know, you have to have a quality internet presence in terms of visibility, and you have to make sure that when they get there, you know, it's going to convert them and, and you actually have good content. It's not just good clinical information. It's emotional, compelling content that gets them to take action. That's what's most important. Um, how does one of my homies, um, it's very important. Like you said, f- fill out contact information or whatever. I mean, I, I'm on dental office websites every single day. What percent of the dental office websites do you think are just like completely lame and inadequate? Whew. Man, uh, a lot of them. It really depends on what the point of the website is. That's the only reason why I hesitate. Well, it, some... it should be to get new patients okay. or, or, or to convert a marketing to, I went to your website and then somehow um, your office is aware that I visited your website and somebody has a chance to try to convert this person who landed on my website to come in and sit in a chair so Doc yeah. can look in their mouth. You would think. I mean, it's, uh, there's there's doctors out there have websites for nothing more than branding, just so you can find them. Uh, but the the overwhelming majority would probably represent the market that you just described. Um, so I would say, here's the biggest problem with dental marketing. Okay, and and here's why the vast majority of it is ineffective at best is because the type of content that they have on the site is not the content that inspires people and compels people. It's just not. The content for the most part, because the practices don't have a good internal marketing system, they don't have video testimonials from the patients, we don't have good before and after photos, we don't have good reviews, they don't have any interviews from the doctors on their website. Um, So for the vast majority of sites out there, there's stock image that these companies get from uh, Shutterstock, and all the sites look the same. They have a generic look and feel. The content is pretty much limited to procedural-based content, and it's just not the content that's gonna be effective in getting someone to take action and getting someone interested in an outcome. It's all procedural-focused, and it's just boring. Um, How could one of my homies listening to you right now uh, find out if his website was uh, good or lame? Well, the, the best thing to do uh, would be to ask themselves one question. I'll, I'll give you an, an answer in terms of what they can do to have us help them with that. But here's the question. The question is, what, what constitutes compelling content in our market, right? When I ask doctors this question, I'm standing up at CEs, I ask them, I say, guys, what is your number one source of new patients that's the most consistent, that delivers the most the, the most amount of quality? the highest amount of quality. What would you say it is, Howard? Source of new patient. What get, what's the most consistent and delivers the best quality? Where do you get them from? 
word of mouth referral from existing exactly patients. exactly so word of mouth referral so what are they saying if i go and and you're my dentist you work with me i go home i'm, I'm going to tell my sister and my mother and my father hey you know go see Howard. What am I saying? Am I saying, go see Howard. He's got this awesome CT. Am I saying, go see Howard. He's got Nobel BioCare implants. What, what am I saying to get them to go to you? What types of things am I saying? That they can trust me to, to, uh, uh, help their, you know, fix their teeth, fix them up. They can trust me to get it done. Yeah. So I trust them. I feel, it feels like family when I'm over there. Best guy in the world, you know, gave me this great outcome. It was better than I thought. I was scared to death. It didn't even hurt. It was great, right? They're saying things like that. It's more of relationship style uh, communication. It's not procedural based. So if we know that to be true in every room that I've been in, it's been overwhelmingly the same answer that you just gave. The question is, how do we capture that? And how do we make that our message to the public? How do you do it? I got copywriters and a whole press department that has the right copy. If they've never been to your office, how do they write the content that's going to be compelling? You have to set up the internal marketing structure first. So what we do is we have interviews with the doctors. You get your patients on camera. Right? You use your before and after. Show them your great results. Now, most websites out there, they, they don't have any before and afters. Go on their cosmetic dentistry page. You don't see any good before and afters, how you change the way people look, change their quality of life. So all of the content is totally backwards. It's all about how we do procedures. It's not about how the outcomes change our patients' lives. And that's the fundamental problem with dental marketing. And it was a single uh, most compelling reason why we had to build out uh, our video department with three video crews and why, why we had to hire photographers is because when we have that type of content, we're so effective with, with so much less. When we don't have that type of content, I've got copywriters that have to create it. We've got graphic designers that have to build graphics and create infographics. And we have to buy images because we, we have nothing else. And when you do that, it's going to have a generic look and feel. It's not going to be compelling uh, to the patients. And you're, and worst off, you're going to look just like every other practice in your city. You know, So it, it's become very simple. As long as we have that good internal marketing and we capture the patient experience, we have interviews with the doctor, and your entire website focuses around what's most important and what inspires people instead of you know, the boring crap in terms of procedures that they're just looking to commoditize anyways. You know, I took a lesson from online dating and I just downloaded a picture of Brad Pitt and put it <laughs> on my dental office. And then, right. then when every patient shows up, they say, you, you don't look like your, your online picture. I say, picture says a thousand words. Yeah, but come on, man. I mean, you can sell, so you can overcome that. You just okay. got to get them in the door, right? Okay, but my, my homies listening to you, you know, they, they dream about finding the fourth canal and a root canal. They, uh, you know, they, they dream about, you know, uh, pulling out that wisdom tooth, all that kind of stuff like that. Most everyone I know bought their website five to 10 years ago at a convention special for $19.99. Um, explain to my homies um, how they could... Um, check their website and decide whether it's time for an upgrade or not. <laughs> All right. So number one, you have to determine if the, if the website is, uh, is responsive. So if it doesn't respond, if you have that, one of those old mobile websites, okay, automatically it's time for an update. What is uh, an old mobile website? Where you actually have two websites. You have one website for a desktop and it's actually a different website for mobile. So it'll have a different URL. It'll say like mobile dot, howardforan.com instead of howardforan.com. They actually changed the URL. So it's two websites. That's horrible right now. So, I mean, the, the, the minimum standard for our industry, any anyone that's competent at all has, has responsive and adaptive design. That was like five years ago, um, which is 100 years in normal person time. So that's the first thing to know if you're ready for an upgrade. Um, the second thing is when you look at it, if it has stock photos, if it has stock um, stock content, if it's duplicate content, if you didn't write it, if you didn't have a hand in writing it, then you're going to need an upgrade because it's, it's probably not going to convert. And if you look at it, you pull up your landing pages, if there's no headliners, if it doesn't get you to do something, you probably need an upgrade. Every landing page within the site, if I go to your dental implant pages, if I, if I click on your dental implant page, I land on the page, it should be obvious. What do they want me to see and what am I supposed to do? Oh, they want me to schedule an appointment. They want me to fill this out. They want me to call. And the first thing they want me to see is this video. If you can't say that, just keep it real simple, you know, the, then you have to update it. Because if you don't have a site that can convert, get ready to 
triple your budget, quadruple your budget in certain markets to get to, to, to hit your production goals. So if you don't know any of that stuff and you want us to do it for you, you can, you can uh, enter your information uh, into our website, progressivedental.com, and um, go through everything with you uh, from A to Z. And how much does something like that usually cost? Uh, our consultation process uh, is a fully refundable $500 deposit. We do $500 deposit because it's a, it's a three-part process, okay? Um, the first part is more of a, uh, the first phone call usually takes about 30 minutes, and it's more about getting to know the doctor and getting to know what type of model they have. Because we've got clients that have different models, and all successful, all happy in their own model, um, but we try not to fit every practice or every clinician into one specific model. Um, so the first part is, is determining if what their model is right now and if that is the model that they want long term. Um, then obviously we have to get a look at what's going on in the practice from a number standpoint um, so that we can see some percentages and determine their level of efficiency. Um, that's what the second call is all about. So they have to do a little bit of work. We do a little bit of work. We get those numbers and then uh, we help them create a plan to hit their goals. And the third part is we have to do some market research. So that's why this whole turnkey marketing system doesn't make any sense because marketing tactics are so market contingent. So what works in Birmingham, you might have to have a totally different strategy, you know, down here in Clearwater or Tampa. So uh, to do some market research uh, is absolutely necessary. So we do a three part, um, a three part consultation process. Uh, it's a five hundred dollar deposit that's um, either um, uh, refunded if they don't move forward with anything, or we credit it towards uh, whatever aspect of their plan that they are that they are moving forward with. So that's our process to uh, figure out current state and desired state. So I just sent you an email of a thread. Uh, I just uh, started a thread. Um, what do you think of my dental office website, todaysdental.com? I'm one of the, how old's your dad? He's 63. 63, okay. Um, I'm 54. I bought my website back in the day. Uh, yeah. I, um, but I, I would love to see, uh, I just emailed you that thread. It's called, uh, what do you think of Howard Ferran's website, uh, todaysdental.com? That's my dental office. I just turned 29. Uh, this is September 27th. Uh, September 21, I just turned 29. Um, I want to do a big shindig okay. for when I turn 30, you know, 30 years old. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I would love to have your thoughts on that because um, I, you know, I'm still a wet glove dentist. I would like it to be uh, optimum. And I, I'd love for your feedback on that thread. And I, I sent you an email and I CC'd uh, my office manager, Robert, and uh, uh, the rest of my team. Uh, I'd, I'd love to see what you thought about that. Um, I went over my one hour. You promised me an hour of your life. Uh, I went over. Can I ask a, a, a one overtime question? Yeah, let's go. Um, about isn't it about half of your clients specialist? Yes, a um, uh, little, a little more than half. Okay, a little more than half. Um, talk about that. How are, um, how are, uh, what, what specialist are you doing? We have a lot of specialists. I mean, uh, ended on our show, ended on us. Um, we, I own Ortho Town too. Uh, we have a ton of orthodontists, ended on us. Um, t talk about specialists. Uh, I'm afraid. Uh, I don't know what you just said is applying to all family practice like me and your dad and what would be different uh, with the nine specialties. So, so what did you say the first hour that would be tweaked slightly differently for the nine specialties recognized by the American Dental Association? Well, the simple aspect that the referral patterns are changing and they're not used to taking patients direct from the public. They're just not set up for that. They think, and you know, when you talk to them, oh yeah, we close over the phone at 95%. Well, you should close over the phone at 95%, right? Because, you know, Dr. Ferran just sent the patient that he's had for 20 years and told them to go there. So if they call, they've got every intention of booking an appointment. You should. It's a whole different animal when you're talking uh, direct to uh, uh, direct to consumer. I think it's absolutely 100% necessary um, for specialists to diversify and um, uh, start to uh, attract patients direct from the public, number one, because from a business perspective, it's, it's a smart thing to do if you're looking to the future. And number two, it actually helps them get more referrals. Um, you know, I, I don't know about you, but 
uh, I've got a lot of GPs that really like getting cross refer cross referrals from their periodontist, or their oral surgeon over and above that that bottle of wine at the end of the year when you send them two hundred fifty thousand dollars in you know wisdom teeth or or, or implants and and you never see anything back. Our clients that market they they've done even better with the referrals. So the whole the whole um, myth of oh I'm scared to start ref- marketing because my referrals are going to be offended and they're going to stop referring. That's that's a total fallacy. It's, it's the exact opposite than that. And I think to see how far it's come, you know, we had a, a client actually on main podium at the AAP this year, Dr. Uh, Dr. Toback um, out of, uh, out of uh, New London, Connecticut, his website, shorelineperio.com. And he was actually on on stage, on the podium, going through his direct-to-patient, direct-to-consumer marketing and business strategies to even out his new patients 50-50. But the biggest difference is they just have a longer learning curve uh, in terms of answering the phones, converting the cases uh, internally, uh, but they also receive tremendous benefit um, of getting referrals because they have the ability now for the first time to cross-refer. So, um, I mean, we actually started with the specialists. And, and that happened out of necessity for my dad. I mean, when when he was marketing, he was marketing all cosmetic dentistry and all the competitors are marketing, uh, you know, cheap lumineers and veneers. They were just commoditizing it, whitening as well. And when I looked at it, I said, hey, let's take this entire budget and let's put everything towards Perio. He's like, are you drunk? Perio? I said, no, I, I literally can't find anyone. I can't, I can't find one ad on this. And over half the population has it. Right, over half the population has it. No one's marketing. That means a big, uh, a big demand from the public and limited supply as far as their perception because no one tells them. And so I switched everything over to Perio. Uh, I talked him into uh, to getting a Perio Lays. He got trained on the Lanat procedure. Uh, we brought that into the practice years ago. He's one of the first in the area, and um, we took all of the funds, all of the marketing budget. We put it behind Perio. And we were able to take a practice that had consistently done between a million and a million three for years. And we bumped it up to over three million just for marketing Perio, nothing else. Because marketing Perio brought in not a lot of patients, didn't bring in a lot of patients, but the patients it brought in brought in comprehensive cases. But there was full mouth rehabs in there. There was a, a lot of cases where the patients had complex occlusal issues. It was consistently, you know, between seven and 15 cases. And it totally turned the practice around. And that's how that's how I got my start was by switching marketing from cosmetic and restorative, switching it over to that huge market of perio and, and the periodontist just left a big void because they, they never marketed. And very quickly, you know, they they came around and I've got hundreds of periodontists that are, that are clients of mine. So, um, and, uh, I, I think it's a, just a tremendous market, that implant market and, and the periodontal disease market. Same thing with gum recession now. So it's, it's totally under marketed from a, from an advertising standpoint. And people that have gum recession have a lot of, uh, a lot of other adju- adjunctive, uh, dental services that they need. So sometimes it's not spending more money. It's not like you have to compete with the clear choices and compete with the big box dentist. You just have to use your 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 intellect and figure out niches within the market that that are that are are a large audience that fill a pain point and no one's talking to them. So I got I got my start. We started this company, built this company off the back of marketing periodontal disease, oral systemic connections, um, and symptoms like bad breath, bleeding gums, loose teeth, and it was it is just a tremendous tremendous practice builder. Well, well let, let's say that you're talking to a specialist and he's just starting up right now, a young specialist. Yep. Um, he just opened up his doors. Um, I could see an orthodontist going B to C a lot easier and maybe a pediatric dentist a lot easier than, say, an endodontist or a periodontist or oral surgeon for wisdom teeth. But are you are you do you agree or not really? Or do you think it's all the same? Um, I I don't agree, but no, it's not all the same. Um, I think there's a there's a different level of awareness of what the special specialists do in terms of the public perception. So. Uh, most of the time you meet someone on the street, they know what an orthodontist is. They know what an orthodontist does. It's not the same level of awareness for an endodontist or a periodontist. So the way that you have to advertise is different. You can't advertise the fact that you're an endodontist. You know, you can't advertise the fact you're a periodontist. You have to advertise symptoms that people are acutely aware of. So what are they aware of? Are they aware of, they're aware of that their gums bleed. 
they're they're aware of bad breath. They're aware that their teeth are loose. All of these indications is how you have to grab their attention. You get their attentions with the symptoms, not who you are. Whereas um, an orthodontist can get away with marking ortho and Invisalign and braces just because the 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 public knows what those things are. So um, they can all go direct to public. We have clients in, in all of those areas that do go direct to public. And if I was a specialist just starting out, I would 100% have uh, my growth plan would include my direct to public strategy and my strategy to cross refer specific cases. There's a huge, huge populace of these, uh, the, these cases that are perio ortho related that have both factors. We need to move the teeth in the right position, stabilize a bite, and we also need to treat the disease. And an orthodontist that's working hand in hand with a periodontist or with a GP that treats those type of, of symptoms, they can provide tremendous value cross-referring if they're getting patients direct from the public. And those are the those are the best referral relationships. It's referral relationships that are deemed to be mutually beneficial. These relationships, it, why is it easy for a dentist to say, uh, periodontist is going to knock on the door and say, hey, I can come in and work for 50% of the revenue one day a week and you just keep this in-house. You know, I'll work for I'll work for you. And they go out and get eight or nine contracts. That's an easy decision, an easy thing to justify if they don't get anything back from their periodontist. But if they've got a periodontist that's referring one arch a month and they're also referring a couple full uh, uh, full mouth rehabs or some restorative cases – and they actively refer, well, that's different. Now, I got to think about that, right? So I think the relationships, the referral relationships that are going to last uh, in the coming years are going to be the ones that are mutually beneficial. So to the specialist starting out, you can't be afraid to go direct to the public. You're going to have to go direct to the public. Um, and that's a- actually going to be your best way to get in to a high-performing general dental practice to send you patients because you're coming to the table with something. And for the most part, high-performing general dental practices, when they get a specialist knocking on the door, they come hands out. They don't come with cases to bring first. They come they wanting cases. And uh, those, days are, those days are going bye-bye as far as I'm concerned. You know what's the most sad thing I think about the specialists is that um, in my 29 years and my uh, uh, very good friends in the same zip code dentist, it seems like over the years we have all honed to not the best specialist at all, but the ones the patients like the most. I mean, some of them, they come back and they just say, oh, my God, I love that guy. And then the other ones, they come back and say, that guy's an asshole. And, <laughs> yeah. and you're sitting there thinking, I know, but the asshole has a microscope and it's amazing and he's the best. But the bottom line, we don't send to him. And we, right. we, we send to the ones where the patients come back and say, damn, I love that guy. She is so amazing. I love her to death. Uh, and, and, and they're finishing ortho cases with gaps between the teeth and spaces. And, you know, uh, uh, but, but they, 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 you know, if they love them, you refer to them. And if, you, and if the patients don't like them, it, it's a deal breaker. Well, the patients have to move forward. They have to accept the treatment to get help. You'd hope they, that they would have both. But, um, you know, we talk to a lot of the specialists about that and say, hey, you know, the behavioral aspect of this, that social aspect of uh, being able to relate and, and get into rapport with these patients is so important to continue to get referrals and also to get a high degree of case acceptance. If you if you if your social intelligence is, is low and you can't relate to people and you don't know simple things like mirroring matching and, and controlling your tonality, if you don't know those things, people inherently just don't trust you as much. They just don't feel comfortable. And if they don't trust you and they don't feel comfortable you, with you, they might still buy a cleaning right? But are they going to let you do a full mouth rehab? Are they going to let you do a surgical procedure that they're apprehensive about? Heck no, that's not going to happen. So, uh, I mean, these are all things that come up and you're right from a general dental point of view. If I'm going to refer, you got to refer to somebody that's going to get the patient to accept the case. And and you just hope that if they're not getting a clinical outcome, they'll take your, your feedback um, in terms of, uh, of some guidance and some, some different places they can go to get the didactic knowledge they need. Well, man, I'll tell you what, that was a hell of an hour and a half. I just think that you're an amazing mind. Uh, that's so cool that you're on the under 40 for Tampa and you're in the Inc. 500 fastest growing private companies, that you help your old man double his practice. I mean, you're just the all-American boy, the all-American dream. <laughs> yeah. And I yeah. really, really appreciate you spending an hour and more uh, with my homies today. And I do hope you look at my dental website, todaysdental.com, and tell me, uh, letter grade A B C D E F G H I J K. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, 
I and 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 the thing I feel sorry for you about the most, where where I feel sorry for you, is that dentists don't blink at buying a hundred thousand dollar CAD CAM, a hundred thousand dollar CBCT, a thirty thousand. You know, they always buy this thing, and I'm always telling them that probably the best return on investment is a business consultant. And I, I don't know if I can measure the return on investment of a hundred thousand dollar CBCT, but if you spent half that amount with a consultant or another and the other half on marketing or whatever, whatever. I mean, it, it could double your practice and they only yeah. buy shiny objects that have blinking lights and antennas and, and knobs to turn, um, you know. Well, I, under, I, I understand it. Um, and, and I think that's why our acquisition, this is actually the, the, the first podcast that I've ever done. We've never done any marketing to dentists ourselves direct because we get all of our clients in educational manner. We get them through lecture. And, and I think that it's important to know that whoever you're doing business with from a business standpoint or a marketing and advertising standpoint, you have to know that they have some degree of depth to them, that, that, that they study and, and that they know what they're talking about. And um, a lot of these topics are so far outside of the realm of comfortability and, and familiarity with, with the dentist. I totally understand the, the trepidation um, and, uh, and, and some of the limited beliefs that they have. So that, that's why it's the only way we get our, our, our doctors and our clients is through advanced continuing education courses that we speak at. And I, I feel if I'm, if I'm able to speak in front of a group and add value to them, um, you know, they, they, they'll, they'll seek us out afterwards. And, um, that's been our model to grow. So I understand, I understand why, they feel more comfortable buying technology and why they feel more comfortable taking courses because it's their, it's their, um, their circle of knowledge. And, and what we're talking about right now for the most part is, is not within that circle. So I get it. And it is important for them to do business with people that they can trust and that have their best interest, uh, in mind. And, um, um, I was fortunate enough to have a dad that let me screw up, uh, you know, a hundred times and that couldn't fire me because I was, because my mom wouldn't let him. So I, I had a, a good advantage there and, and just really grateful, uh, grateful for the opportunity to speak with you. And, and like I said, you know, I, I got a chance to watch you lecture at, um, the excellence in dentistry meeting in Destin years ago before I ever had this before I ever started the company and, um, it, you know, before I ever sold, before I ever had one client in dentistry and, 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 um, that course had an impact on me, you had an impact on me. So it's, it's, uh, really cool to, uh, to be sitting right here and I, I appreciate, uh, you know, I appreciate your time. Um, your next, thanks for the kind words. Your, your next course, is it called, is your course called Catalyst? Yes. Yes, that, sir. That's your two day course. Yes, sir. And you only got one more the, this year, and that's uh, in Clearwater, Florida, uh, October 28 and 29? Correct. So, Ryan, the, we filmed these uh, 50, 60 days in advance. Uh, can we release this uh, tomorrow? So tell my homies why they should go to Clearwater, Florida, uh, and, uh, and see your two-day Catalyst course. Well, we, we, ne we were never a – continuing education company, right? I can tell you that. The reason why I had to create this course, everything we've been talking about on this call, setting up the baseline to where the marketing would be effective, we've learned so much in the last five to seven years that it, it's changed and our, our techniques have gotten better and better and better. And there's doctors been with me for seven years. Um, and we have to have a way to re-engage with our clients and also make sure that new clients have these baselines set up. So Catalyst is more so about Con conversion and conversion from our eyes, everything that we're teaching, we're teaching because it was an obstacle from a marketing and patient acquisition perspective. We didn't come in with a binder like a like a traditional consultant and say, hey, this, this is how a practice runs. We're just saying, here's the things that are going to hold the marketing up. So um, it's something that the doctors attend with their team or their key team members. And we go through, uh, we go through uh, all sorts of different uh, trigger points within a new patient experience that affect conversion. So we go through best practices on the phone and, and we go through scripts. We bring people up to the front and role play on tonality, mirroring matching and, and communication. We talk about sales. 
I debunked this whole sales myth that sales is bad. We talk about the sales process using familiar terminology, uh, activating uh, uh, different different heuristics to, to allow the patient to make decisions very easily. We talk about flexible financing. We talk about internal marketing. They're getting reviews. They're getting video testimonials. They're getting before and afters. And it's about 50% lecture, 50% application and hands-on. Um, and then on the, uh, on the second day, we go through several different case studies in marketing, um, half of which were successful case studies from a marketing perspective, half of which were unsuccessful. And I learned m- just as much, if not more, from the campaigns that are unsuccessful because where it really gets fun is launching a campaign doesn't have the result you want, but you're tracking it. So you make a couple strategic adjustments and watch how the results change. So we go through and show case studies of what worked, what didn't. And anyone that's marketing right now or anyone that wants to market and grow their practice in the future, um, I feel like it, it, it would be tremendous value and um, they'd have a great time and learn basically everything we've learned from a conversion standpoint in the last seven years. We tried to hit all of the high nails over the course of those two days. I mean, I, I say that I always repeat myself, not because um, I'm old and dumb and senile. I am all those things, but I, uh, it's the fact that, I mean, I've seen it for 29 years that every seminar you go to, half the room is individual dentists coming by themselves to save money. And the other half of the room, every row is an entire yep. team. And if I went and picked up the 1041s, IRS forms, of the dentists that brought their teams versus the dentists that come alone to save money, the dentists that brought their whole teams yeah. make the most money. And you know who makes the very most money? No question. You know who makes the very most money? Is when you'll see like three rows of this whole office and the damn dentist doesn't even come. And they're like, oh yeah, yeah he's, he's out playing golf today. He says, uh, you know, this is our deal. And it's just like, they just, God. And then they say things like, well, what if I invest a bunch of money bringing my staff and then she quits? And I say, you know what's worse? What if you don't invest the money and she stays with you yeah. for 20 years? Exactly. Well, they, well, they just don't do it. I mean, that's that. Yeah. No, every time a dentist comes or, or a specialist comes and they don't bring their team after the course, every single time they say, God, I wish my I wish my team was here. God, I, I, I should have brought I should have brought so and so. I should have brought the team. And it, it happens every single course. So we try to tell them beforehand, hey, if you're not going to bring the whole team, bring bring your key team members for sure. Well, um, I'm going to. We're going to move this to the top of the queue so it goes out tomorrow so the homies can hear it before your last course of the year. And if you, uh, if you call your next-door neighbor, uh, Bill Strupp, uh, uh, who's one of my best buddies, and tell him that uh, he has to go out with me after your course to go to a bar, I'll actually fly to Clearwater, Florida if I can kill your seminar and then go drink with uh, Bill Strupp afterwards. I think he is one of the coolest guys. He's one of those old-fashioned guys. Your dad knows who he is. Um, he, you know, my seven restorations are all gold and, uh, Bill's uh, does the finest gold work in the world. In fact, probably half his clients are dentists. He just meticulous, perfect gold wow. work. Uh, I just love everything about that guy. The only thing he ever did wrong in his whole life is he married an attorney. How can you imagine that? Oh, oh my God. He's <laughs> sleeping with the enemy. Oh man. We have to deal with enough of those on a daily basis, don't we? Okay, well, tell your dad that uh, I said he should be a very proud dentist, and uh, thanks so much for being on my show. Hey, thank you, Howard. Uh, I look forward to uh, connecting with you at some of these conferences, and, and uh, anything I can do for you, you let me know. Don't, don't, don't hesitate to reach out, okay? All right, buddy. Thanks for all your time. You're amazing. Thank you, Howard. See you.